going to talk. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello and welcome to our software vendors as business associates uh, webinar. We did this last month and the demand was so high and we had a couple of mess ups with the messaging and, and so forth. So we decided to we decided to do it again. And if I could get this to click to the next slide, that would be helpful. Okay, my name is Carlos Leva. I'm CEO of Three Lions Publishing, the publisher of the Hip Survival Guide. And I'm also an attorney and managing partner with the Digital Business Law Group. Now, uh, as you know, we take questions uh, throughout the webinar. So if anybody attended last month and has some questions that they'd like to lead off with, that's fine. You can put them in the, into the chat, and, and uh, Martin will collect them. Uh, Martin, I think you're also going to make the materials available, right? I don't think they're available yet. At least I don't see them. Uh, they are in the handouts, one of five. Oh, they are? Okay, maybe I just, I got you. I don't have that expanded, so I can't see that. Yeah. Actually, I don't, I don't see the handouts at all. It says, it says zero on my end, but that's okay. If they're in there, uh, that's fine. Here's what we're going to cover today. Who qualifies as a business assistant? I think there's still some confusion um, even this late in the game regarding that. Um, business associate compliance with the privacy rule, the security rule, and breach notification rules. I think everyone should know that by statute, a business associate has to comply with these directly now, not only through the contract. Um, obviously, we want to talk about business associate contracts and covered entities due diligence vis-a-vis uh, -vis the contract and also a Business associates due diligence vis-a-vis -vis contracts that they may have with subs. Now, this is specifically in the software vendor as a business associate space, right? So there's a lot of EHR vendors and uh, billing vendors and uh, you know people that sell software to covered entities that mostly now have migrated to the cloud that have some special issues surrounding uh, the type of business associate that they are and, and some of the risks, liabilities surrounding that. Um, we think that software vendors really should take the lead here with compliance because there's a lot of covered entities that are hopelessly still it's in the sand and it could be a differentiator for uh, for a software vendor to become the subject matter expert, to become the smartest person in the room, to sort of lead with an understanding of compliance as a differentiator, marketplace differentiator, something that can help the vendor uh, sell. Um, I have to caveat that, though, with this. You know, vendors like to say that their products are HIPAA compliant. We have a HIPAA compliant this. We got a HIPAA compliant email security system. We got um, that's really just marketing speak, okay? Because there's only two types of entities that can be that can be HIPAA compliant: covered entities and business associates. Okay? There are there is no such thing as a HIPAA compliant product. There are products that help you comply with HIPAA, but that's an entirely different concept. So when you hear HIPAA compliant um, yada yada yada. You have to take that as uh, with a grain of salt, and really, it's just uh, marketing speak. Okay, so we've already talked about the, the there is no business associate light for software vendors or for any other business associates. You now have to comply statutorily with the privacy rule, the security rule. Or breach notification rule. That means that HHS or a state attorney general can come after you directly as a business associate, okay? Quite apart from whether or not you have a contract signed uh, with the covered entity. And you become a business associate by operation of law. It's just a fancy way of saying that if you're taking the covered entity's PHI and doing something with that PHI on the covered entity's behalf, you are a business associate even if you don't have a contract with a covered entity. And if you share PHI with a subcontractor, for that subcontractor to perform a business function on your behalf, that subcontractor is a business associate 
by operation of law. Obviously, uh, you're going to be um, fined if you don't have the contract, right? So it's a violation of the rules, but that's not what triggers the relationship. So all of this came into being as part of the High Tech Act. There was no such thing as direct business associate compliance prior to the promulgation of the High Tech Act, right? And so if you just read uh, these overview sections, you can see business associates almost everywhere in 13401, 13402, notification in case of breach, application of privacy provisions. I mean, it, 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 a large part of the High Tech Act was directed towards business associates, including now, quote unquote, improved enforcement and audits. So business associates are going to be audited just like covered entities. And I don't know uh, how many of you have heard, uh, but HHS um, likely sometime in early 2016, yes, it's going to start their formal audit program, so they say, but they're also going to start what I call a desk audit which means they're just going to go out and, and call you and ask for documents. And they're going to ask for specific documents. For sure, they're going to ask, show me the documentation of your last risk assessment. Show me how you um, capture security incidents and track them. Show me your policy for this, that, or the other. Okay? If you've, stuck, if you've had your head stuck in the sand since 2009, you're going to fail that desk audit, and then they're going to come back and do a real audit. Now, I, I seriously doubt that they listen to me or hang out on the HIPAA Survivor Guide LinkedIn group or blah, blah, blah. But I made the suggestion about six or seven months ago that all HHS had to do was to get a bunch of interns in-house. If they wanted to prove in enforcement, have interns make calls gather documents, and then have two or three young lawyers right out of law school reviewing these basic documents, and you could do thousands of audits. You don't have to go out and hire KPMG and do, because, because the majority of the healthcare industry is still non-compliant. So this is a potential gold mine. And the High Tech Act, I can't remember specifically which one of these sections I think it may become under audits or improved enforcement, says that any money that HHS collects vis-a-vis -vis fines goes back into HHS's coffers for more enforcement action. Now, HHS is not taking advantage of that, okay? And they've really, outside of breach notification, they haven't been that tough on enforcement. They've been so lax that the Office of Inspector General last month called them out on it and said, hey, you guys aren't doing your job. You guys need to step up on smaller breaches. You need to do more of this, more of that, blah, blah, blah. And I think these desk audits were a uh, HHS part of HHS's response to the OIG. Okay, now, who knows why HHS hasn't been pressed to enforce more. It's probably a political decision. And it could be a political decision to start enforcing in a much more serious way. And here's why. Because all this talk that you hear about cyber warfare and cyber crime and cyber attack and all this is real. It's not going away anytime soon, right? It's it's just going to get worse and worse. Security is going to be something that we becomes part of our daily lives, you know. And and the U.S. government, just like other governments, recognize that the healthcare infrastructure, just like the grid, the the electric grid, healthcare infrastructure is mission critical to the nation. If an enemy somehow got in and took out all our hospitals nationwide. That, that would do serious damage. Lots of people would die. Lots of people would go uh, without health care for days. And it would have major repercussions should that happen. And because everybody's connected to everything, uh, especially with the Internet of Things, right? We've got all these devices that are now connected. Your security is only, your national security is only going to be as good as your weakest link. And in healthcare. care, there are millions of weak links, okay? So 
anybody that was hoping and praying that the high tech act would just be a fad, it would just go away. They're just dream, dream, they're just living in dreamland. It's not. It's not going to go away for lots and lots of reasons. We're now in the 21st century, yada yada. But the cyber war thing, the cyber security thing, is only going to become more paramount. Uh, you know, you have more uh, incidents like the incidents in in in, um, in Paris. We'll talk about encryption. This is going to be front and center for a long, long time. So, Martin, any 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 accumulated questions? We have one question. What do I, as a BA, need to do formally when I do the due diligence of my of a CE? Well, you know, usually that due diligence goes the other way. The CE does a due diligence, should be doing a due diligence of you, and you need to be, you the business associate will have to do a due diligence of any business associate subcontractors that you do, okay, that you have. Now, if you don't have any, if you don't share the PHI that you get with any subs, well, then you don't have any BAs that you got to do a due diligence with. Here's the thing. Uh, what you have to do is you have to monitor the contract. So previously, prior to the High Tech Act, it was the covered entity that had to monitor the contract. And what does that mean? Well, what, I'll tell you what it doesn't mean. It doesn't mean monitor the business associates' operations 24-7 because that's an impossibility. Nobody can do that, right? Uh, what it means is that if, if you, as a covered entity, knew that the business associate, your business associate, was in material breach of the contract, you had an affirmative duty to act. You had to get the business associate to try to cure it. Uh, you had to you had to fire the business associate, or you had to make some kind of plea to HHS as to why it would be really really bad if you had to let this business associate go, and you'd have to make your case as to uh, why you should continue even though the business associate is in material breach. Now there's a now there's reciprocal monitoring, which means that a business associate also has to monitor the contract. That doesn't mean that a business associate has to monitor the covered entity 24-7 operationally, right? So the question is, the, the, the answer is this. If you're trying to get, what the, what the rule says is, you got to get satisfactory assurances that your business associates are doing what they're supposed to do. Now, those are weasel words. Those are words that, that, that um, where liability can, found, can be found. They're huge. You can drive truck, trucks worth planes through that that, that uh, satisfactory assurances. But I can tell you, and, and so what does it mean? Ultimately, the court of law is going to mean, but it means more than just having a contract. Having a contract doesn't mean you have satisfactory assurances because if you hire this business associate and this business associate has a major breach, okay, and you never ask them for their, their latest risk um, assessment documentation, their policies, procedures, you know, in our model business associate contract, we, we say within 30 days, the business associate has to provide the covered entity X, Y, and Z. Okay? And that's how you go about making a case that you've done what your due diligence and you've gotten satisfactory assurances because you can say, well, we reviewed their last risk assessment and our plan is to get a do a review once a year. And we reviewed their policies and procedures and we think that they're doing the right thing. Then you can make a good faith argument that you did something to get satisfactory assurances. And if you're a BA and you have a sub, same requirement, right? Our business associate to business associate model contract has the same kind of language. Within 30 days, get documentation. So, is there well, a follow up question? Yes, there is. Uh, what if a BA knows that a CE is not doing what it's supposed to do? That's not very specific there by supposed to do, but that's what it is. A, 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 a BA has an affirmative duty to act. As an affirmative duty, if, if, if it knows that, that um, the covered entity is in material breach of the contract, then it has to approach the covered entity and, and do the same thing a covered entity would have to do. That's what it means to to have reciprocal monitoring of the contract. In other words, you can't look the other way. That's that's common sense 
as a practical matter, that's what it comes down to. If you know the other party is in material breach of the contract, you have an affirmative duty to act. That's it for the moment. Okay. So who's a business associate? Well, for the longest time, prior high tech, you had a list of people, administrative, accountant, actuarial, consulting, software providers, you know, there's a laundry list. The definition is this. If you are a business partner of a covered entity, which for all intents and purposes for now we can we can say is a healthcare provider, wherein that healthcare provider provides you PHI, or you have access to PHI on a regular basis, or you're actually hosting PHI on behalf of that covered entity in order to perform a business function for the covered entity, then you're a business associate. That's, and these are all just examples. Now, software vendors, the mere fact that you sold a software product doesn't make you a business associate, but if you're providing support and you occasionally go in and look at the application and the database wherein you would be uh, exposed to the covered entity's PHI, then you are a business associate. So. Most enterprise, let's say electronic health record or practice management uh, uh, vendors have support staff that, you know, from time to time on a regular basis have to dial in and try to figure out what's going on. And when they do that, they're looking at PHI just because that's the nature of what is stored there. And so for all intents and purposes, most software vendors are going to be business associates. Now, unless you just sell something and you provide no support at all, then you wouldn't be. Okay? Now, there is an exception, and I think this this exception, uh, it's been there for a long time, but I don't think it applies to too many use cases anymore. If you had an employee uh, of a software vendor uh, that, that remained full-time on site. Let's say you had a big customer and you just assigned Joe, John Doe to that customer site and that John Doe was kind of treated as one of the covered entities workforce, okay? Then rather than be being a, a BA, John Doe could be treated as a workforce member and the software vendor could get out of that exception because the software vendor, the John Doe in that case would be under the auspices of the covered entity and would be treated as part of the uh, part of the workforce. All right, so you know there's a laundry list of um, businesses that um, that are, uh, are that are going to be software business associates, right? For billing, for EHRs, transcriptions, and on and on and on, right? What is who is not a business associate are any anybody that for pre, for treatment payment and operations a covered entity is sharing PHI with so other covered entities nursing services lab services radiology these are all going to be uh, not business associates they're just other covered entities and they're excluded as part of the payment payment treatment and operations exception now one thing to be clear because there are software vendors that deal with PHI but are not business associates, okay? And and where that scenario, where that fact pattern comes into play, I'll give you an example because this, was a, this is a real world example. Somebody called me and these are the kinds of questions you as a software community have to ask, right? It says this particular, this particular vendor was getting PHI from a school. I believe it was a high school on the West Coast. And they were getting PHI to help the school track sports injuries. And the question is, are they a business associate? Well, they were definitely getting PHI. There's no question about that. They were getting health information for individuals. It was identifiable to an individual. But the school is not a covered entity. Okay, so unless you're doing it, the school is not classified as a healthcare provider. So despite the fact that they were getting PHI, they weren't a business associate and HIPAA didn't apply to them. Now that may be counterintuitive, but it is only if you're getting PHI from a covered entity 
that HIPAA and HITECH are going to apply. Okay, what about you know janitorial companies and people that cut the grass and all that? They are incidental to they you know seeing PHI is incidental to what they do, so they're not classified as a business associate. Just like your ISP, right? Your pipe providers, UPS, FedEx, those guys have, have, are not are not um, considered to be software associates because what they because their use their contact with PHI is in, incidental to what they do. So this is what we talked about before. You don't have to monitor operations, but if a covered entity knows of a pattern of activity or practice that constitutes a material breach of the violation, they have an affirmative duty to act. And if the business associate knows of a pattern of activity by the covered entity that constitutes a material breach, then you have an affirmative duty to act. So there's lots more cooks in the compliance kitchen, essentially, right? You got you got uh, reciprocal monitoring, you essentially have more cops on the beat. Okay, this is an old definition. It didn't really change. Uh, this was the proposed definition prior to the High Tech Act. It didn't really change who a business associate was. The High Tech Act does say that health information organizations, e-prescribing gateways, uh, any of those interoperability companies, they are they are business associate by definition. On the other hand, you know, companies that produce personal health records, which are really have gone the way of dinosaurs, right? That never took off. Google Health, Google got out of the personal health record business. Microsoft Health Vault, I think, is still viable, but it's only viable in this sense. If Microsoft Health Vault is tied to an EHR vendor's offering, like Epic or Cerner or something, then Microsoft is considered to be a business associate. Okay, if it's a standalone product that only deals with consumer data, then uh, Microsoft would not be considered to be a business associate. So a lot of people ask, well, what about um, all these consumer devices now that, um, you know, that capture vitals and how many miles you've run and yada, yada, and they're not, if you're a software vendor in that space, you're not, you're, you're getting PHI directly from the consumer, so you're not a business associate because it's not you're not dealing with a covered entity, right? As long as you're as long as you're just directly dealing with the consumer or some other intermediary that is not a covered entity, you're not a business associate. Let me stop there, Martin. Is there any any uh, questions? I've lost Martin, so I'm going to continue. No, no, you're fine. I'm sorry. We opened a small can of worms here, and, and we're going to get going. Does a BA have to follow up with C for updated BAA contract, especially since high tech? Well, the answer is the answer is depends on what the meaning of is is. No, it depends on what the meaning of follow up. Is that if you had a if you had a business associate contract prior to the omnibus rule being promulgated, which is somewhere in March 2013 timeframe, okay? If you had a business associate agreement that was otherwise high tech compliant, okay, uh, then you were grandfathered in for a year because the omnibus rule made some changes to what had to be included into the business associate agreement. Well, we're now past a year, that grandfathered year, we're now long past that. So if if you, and that was just assuming that you already had a high tech compliant business associate agreement, but you hadn't made, you hadn't made the omnibus rule updates. If you didn't have a high tech compliant agreement by the time the omnibus rule came out, you didn't get that year, you weren't grandfathered in for a year, you had, you had to get ready and get compliant right now. So the question is, do you have a omnibus rule high tech compliant agreement? <clears throat> as long as you do, there's no rule that says that you got to that you have to review that once a year, etc. But it's a practical matter, and if you're really trying to avoid liability by getting satisfactory assurances, 
I think most covered entities are taking the opportunity to review their BA agreements once a year so that they can say, hey, once a year we're getting updated risk assessments, updated documentation. That's how we're that's how we're continuing to get satisfactory assurances because it's going to do you little good to say, yeah, we got satisfactory assurances 10 years ago and you know now it comes out a decade later you've never gone back to revisit whether the BA was still complying. It turns that the it turns out the BA was you know in, in, in the business of selling your PHI and had been for a very long time and if you had done more due diligence you would have found out. Okay, uh, so that as a practical matter you know, a yearly review is recommended, and I think that's what probably a, a, a lot of the CEs that are interested in complying, which for right now probably means the majority of the bigger covered entities. The majority of the smaller and mid-sized covered entities, I think, have remained purposely with their head stuck in the sand, hoping that they don't ever get audited, hoping that they don't ever have a breach. But I think this desk audit thing may change the game a little bit because, you know, where it costs you a lot of money to send out a team to do a, an audit, to have a bunch of interns, I'm saying interns, I don't know who HHS is going to use, but let's say they're using a bunch of interns to go out and ask for documents and then having a couple of young lawyers review those, that doesn't take that much money. So, you know, where you could do hundreds in one case, you might be able to do tens of, tens of thousands in another case and actually reach a lot more people. Um, you, you answered this question. I'm going to restate it anyway, and then I'm going to follow up with something else. Our EHR vendor refuses to sign a BAA saying that they aren't required since they don't make use of the PHI. And the question was, this: this correct? And you had already answered that, but this looks like it's uh, a workaround for that. BA software vendor retains an individual to provide consulting services that involve access to PHI. The individual agrees to sign subcontract, some co subcontractor BAA, but, uh, but does not have its own formal compliance program, no formal risk assessment, no employee education, since he's only the employee. Anyway, for the BA software vendor to be protected, short of not engaging the consultant. No, I mean you're not any, any kind of any kind of you know workaround that involves some sort of crazy loophole like that is just begging to be found in in in, in willful neglect and get a a serious fine. I can't say. First of all, if this EHR vendor is hosting your PHI on the cloud, okay, they're just flat out lying to you. I mean, if they got your PHI on the cloud, they are flat out lying to you. It doesn't matter whether they use the the PHI they access, maintain anybody that access, maintains, transmits, and they clearly maintain it. It's no, it's it's not, it's beyond question. Microsoft. Amazon, all these cloud storage providers that a lot of the EHR vendors have are using. They are also, they're also business associates now, and the, and they have been since 2011, right? So the only time that an EHR vendor could say we're not a business associate is if their software is located on your site and they never access it to provide you support. Now, how often does that happen? Okay, otherwise. They're they're just flat lying to you. It's just they're a business associate. Period. Uh, we have a BA contract. We had a BA contract prior to Omnibus, but C never sent updated contract to include Omnibus updates. Who is responsible for getting the updated contract? The BA or the CE? Well, see, this is this is that's a great that's a great question. Both parties are. Both parties are. This is not a CE only thing. Both parties. It's a con you can't have a contract unless you have both parties. So <clears throat> in that case, both parties could be fine. Both parties would be fine. If I were an auditor and I walked in and that was the situation, I'm going to find the CE and I'm going to find the BA. If they knew they had an outdated contract because nobody took responsibility here. Okay? Both people are in violation. Both entities are in violation. 
Okay. Are EMS agencies covered entities? Emergency, like ambulance agencies? Is that uh, I, I'm assuming that's what it is. Uh, emergency uh, services. Yeah, I mean they're they're they're, they're dealing with, they're dealing with PHI all the time, right? They they they're 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 uh, treating you. They're giving you uh, drugs when they come pick you up. Often they're definitely uh, business associates or health, well they're healthcare providers. And if you they're healthcare providers, and if you're dealing with them, you know then you could be a business associate. Um, I believe you answered this, but we'll just cover it again. We prescribe our patients' prescriptions to Walgreens, Walmart, etc. Walgreens are would Walgreens and Walmart be considered a business associate? Yeah, whether or not whether or not the uh, whether or not the pharmacy. Are um, business associates. Uh, I, I think that um, HHS has provided guidance really a, uh, a, a long time ago regarding that, and it's my understanding that uh, that they're going to be business associates for sure. They don't. They're not. They're not. Even though they're dispensing, even though they're dispensing scripts, I don't think they they fall under the. Um, you know, they, they don't become a healthcare provider uh, for that reason. Now, I'd have to go back and, 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 and look at that. I mean, they're definitely on the hook, right? They're either going to be treated as a healthcare provider because they're providing scripts or they're going to be a BA. And so in any case, uh, in any case, they're on the hook. And I'm trying to think back. There was a famous case with Walgreens and an employee about a year and a half ago, and I can't, I can't remember if they were treating it as a, a covered entity. Or not? You could make a, you could make a case that that, that they are um, a healthcare provider, but if they're not, they're definitely a business associate. Uh, I think that was the one in Connecticut where they used uh, HIPAA as the standard of care, and and that Wal Walgreens was negligent uh, because the individual had released uh, the the um, plaintiff's uh, prescription information. Yeah, there, there, there was a pharmacist who, who had a boyfriend, and the boyfriend and the pharmacist colluded to uh, look at uh, the boyfriend's ex's prescriptions, and um, definitely the employee was found to be liable. Okay, and but uh, whatever state court also held Walgreens liable for. Um, Respondeat superior. Essentially, you're responsible for your employees, and therefore, we're going to hold you liable. Which was really a, a landmark case because prior to that, it was only the rogue doctors or nurses or pharmacists that were held liable, and not the organization itself. So, um, uh, we got a little note here that says that. Um, HHS considers pharma pharmacy as healthcare providers and are covered entities. Yeah. Okay. Uh, <laughs> that's all we got for the moment. Okay. So here's here's what it, what the world looks like now. The, the covered entity the covered entity has could have a direct line of business associates, and then the business associates could have a, a direct line of subcontractors. The covered entity, just to be clear doesn't have to have contract with subcontractors. That's the business associate's role. So you have this cascading sort of uh, list of players, okay? But you're only always dealing with your direct players. So a covered entity has to have contracts with all its business associates. Business associate one has to have uh, subcontractor agreements with all its subs. And then when you look at reporting for breach notification, Let's say there was a breach on a system that had PHI at subcontractor one. Subcontractor one would have 60 days to report to business associate one. Business associate one would have 60 days to report to the covered entity. And it's always the covered entity that reports to HHS 
the individual or the media. So for, so for contracts, it runs one way. For breach notification, it runs the other. Now, normally, it's the 60 days. But if there's an agency relationship, okay, now our software, our business associate contracts say each party is not the part is not an agent of the other, and that's standard in most contracts. That's standard boilerplate uh, contract language, okay. But it really doesn't matter because agency is determined by how much control one entity has over another, not by what you say in in a contract, okay. And the Supreme Court will apply has applied federal common law that has about 20 factors that they look at to, to determine the amount of control. Okay, and I, I'll just give you an example of where agency could be found. And what, and what happens is agency changes the 60-day time period. Okay, and that's why uh, it's important. And this could be important for software vendors, uh, especially if you're using independent contractors, and the independent contractors are um, using PHI, their business associates, and uh, but you have almost total control over the independent contractor, right? So if, but I, let me give you another example that's maybe easier to understand. Let's say you have a practice of five, five or six doctors, ten nurses, so many assistants. You got a good size practice, but you know, one of the doctors has a brother-in-law that used to be a CPA. He's not an employee, but he does all the accounting work. He does all the, the, the you know, the, the filing the taxes. Well, but you're the only client. Your practice is the only client. You tell him when to show up. You give him, you tell him what days he can have off. You don't pay him as a W-2, but essentially you control, you have absolute control of that individual's economic life. Well. There's an argument that the IRS could make and that a court of law could make that, you know, despite the fact that you say that your brother-in-law is an independent contractor and it's not your agent, to us, looking at these 20 factors, we think he's an agent of yours because that's how, because you would exert that much control. Now, in the software industry, this happens all the time, right? You got subs out of NDS, I mean, all kinds of subcontractors at Microsoft, Google, that everybody in the software industry utilizes, and, and this has been a known problem for a long, long time for other reasons, okay, but uh, because the IRS would say, no, you're treating these people independent contractors, but they're really employees, and so you need to back pay the FUDA, SUDA, and all that payroll stuff that you haven't been paying us, right? That was That's a completely separate issue from the agency relationship, but the import of the agency relationship is if there's a breach in an information system controlled by an agent, a business associate that is an agent of yours, you, the CE, or you, the business associate, right? Well, let's just say if you're you you're you the CE in this case, right? You're deemed to know to have constructive knowledge of the breach as soon as your brother-in-law knew that there was a breach. So let's say your brother-in-law lost a laptop that had a bunch of PHI in it and just didn't tell you for 60 days. Well, you just missed your deadline because you are deemed to have constructive knowledge at the time that your brother-in-law found out that there was a breach. Okay, so that is the import of an agency relationship. So that's just you know something to watch out for okay like we said it's going to be determined by the federal law of agency there's a famous case community for uh, creative versus Reed 1989 famous Supreme Court case where they went through the factors um, now this is the question we, we talked about before about the EHR vendor there are Really, no differences. There, 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 there's no business associate light for attorneys, accountants, consultants versus a um, EHR vendor. You know, I mean, there's just no, no, not, nothing called a streamline. In the regulations, they just says they treat everybody equally. Okay, but really, everybody's not equally because attorneys are, are not equal because attorneys, accountants, sometimes consultants, they're coming on site and they're looking at PHI while while they're on site, 
Okay, so there's very little risk of uh, for an attorney um, losing or having a breach of PHI on systems that the attorney controls, unless the attorney has taken a bunch of it and is doing something with it for non, you know, uh, and this is not for litigation purposes, for other purposes. Okay, so there's a lot more risk, let's say, on individuals that store PHI on the cloud or on their own system. So if you're going to pick and choose where you need to do more due diligence, this is probably a line. Not to say that you can ignore, I mean, if an attorney is looking at PHI on a regular basis for a some legal function that he or she is performing on behalf of a covered entity, he or she is a business associate, okay? And I personally will avoid like avoid that like in play because I don't want to comply with the security rule and all that. I don't want that. Right? I don't want to see any of your PHI. I'll give you advice, but I don't want to see any of your PHI because because that would mean I would have to comply. But now it I could probably formulate a compliance plan that would be business a business associate like plan, sort of, because the security rule has what's called the flexibility principle that says, well, what would a reasonable attorney, what would a reasonable organization of your size, complexity, blah, 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 do in this particular situation? And some of the specifications in the security rule are required. Some of them are addressable. Bottom line is you don't get out of doing that assessment, though. you got to go through that entire process, document it, have policies in place, there just is no, despite the flexibility principle, there is no accounting. But look, as a practical matter, and, and this is always going to come down to a practical business decision that you're trying to mitigate and limit your risk, right? Whether you're a CE or you're a software vendor using subs, you know, you only have so much budget to do this compliance stuff, right? And everyone knows that the compliance budget is never nearly enough. So you're going to be making trade-offs and decisions is, given this budget, how do I best mitigate my risk? I would do a lot more due diligence on BAs that are EHR vendors, storage companies, that, that we give PHI, we being the CE, give PHI to, and they store it on their respective systems. That's where I would focus my efforts. Any questions there, Martin? Yes. Um, it, okay, here's the question is whether how a VA can subcontract to an individual person if that person does not have a formal HIPAA compliance program since he's a one-person shop in parentheses. Is there a way for the VA to treat the subcontractor as an employee of the VA for HIPAA purposes, similar to a CE tr treating on-site BA employee as a CE employee. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question, and I don't think I don't think that there's I don't think that there's an express regulation or express exception or guidance, but I would I would I, I would expect that the same would apply that. That if that individual is coming to work on site, now he's probably an agent of yours if he is, if you have that much control. But if you, if he's coming to work every day, or she's coming to work every day, and, and really is behaving more like a part of your workforce, right? Where you, you train them the way you train your employees, and et cetera, et cetera. That that I would make the argument if I were your attorney that that exception should apply equally to business associates as it does to CEs because I see no reason why it wouldn't. Okay, I, I I just don't think that that issue has come up that I'm aware of or that um, or or that HHS has provided guidance. But I would argue, and I think probably successfully, that that it's, that workforce exception would apply to business associates as well. And 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 you're right by asking is that these independent contractors where we're we're turning into a free agent nation, right? There are a lot of independent contractors out there that pose this particular problem. They're just a single individual. They don't have a formal compliance program. The, the, the answer from the regs is it doesn't matter. They don't care. If you're an individual solo practitioner or CPA, you, you're using PHI, you're a business associate, business associate, that's it. 
you, you, you better you know get a program in place, right? Uh, but what we talked about those are mo there are limitations there because most of the time those type of consultants are coming on site. The, you know, it's not to say that you can do nothing. You can't. It's not to say that you shouldn't have business associate contracts with them. You do. You must. But you're probably going to get slapped on the wrist, right? You're probably not going to be found in willful neglect, um, you know, uh, for that sort of thing. Now, you know, if you did a, a – if you outsourced your PHI to your EHR vendor on the cloud or your transcriptionist in India, they had a major breach, you didn't have a contract in place with them, that's a whole different story. You're probably going to be found to be in willful neglect, okay? And that's the topic here of international business associates, but I'll wait and see if – if, if uh, Martin's got any follow-up questions. Yes. If you have a missing phone that may or may not have a full-face photo of a patient on it taken to document a medication reaction and the phone is lost, when does the 60 days begin? When is it determined whether the photo identifies a patient or when the pho photo was... No, the 60 days, the 60 days is going to start when when the CE knew or should have known. All right, you have a lost phone and and you know your employee says, you know, I think I had some PHI on that phone, then that's when that's when you that's when the clock starts ticking. Right then. Okay? Um, now we all know mobile mobile devices are a nightmare. We have a whole mobile we have a social media mobile uh, compliance checklist. And our recommendations for mobile is you should treat mobile devices, pads, phones, laptops, even PCs, you should treat them all as access-only devices. They get lost, they get stolen. I mean, how many lost laptops have we seen now breaches because of that, right? And if you don't, then you should mandate that they be encrypted, all right? Do one or the other. But the easiest thing to do is to say don't store PHI on any local devices period. These are only access-only devices. Now, coming from a PC world, right, that we've all been in for the last 15 years, everybody stored everything wherever they wanted, right, and they accessed it, they stored it on their PC, you know, and they had, you know, on a PC now with giga, hundreds of gigabytes of, of uh, storage space, you could store millions of records, and somebody could walk into your office and steal your PC and you just lost a million records, and you're probably going out of business because you can't you can't pay the notification fines, right? But with phones and pads and all that, that's just made the problem an order of magnitude worse. Now I know the industry is not going to heed, right? Because the doctors want their toys, but that is the easiest way to solve the mobile problem is just by policy, and then make a re and then make make people register their mobile devices. And log to see if this mobile device, the ID, the unique identifier that's on every mobile device and PC, pad, etc. If that's not one that's been recognized within your organization, then you don't give them access. Now I know that the software community, you know, God bless them, everybody's got to make a living. They are out trying to provide solutions that deal with security and encryption and on the device itself. Well. That's okay, you know. I mean, yes, that's better better that than nothing. But you can solve that problem just by not having it on the device at all, and treating it as only as an access only device. Okay. Now I know that I know that was more than that. What was asked? But um, you know, BYOD, bring your own device, is just a a a nightmare for covered entities and business associates. But what about the question of dealing with international business associates? It's definitely, software companies, right? Are outsourcing stuff to India, to China, to Brazil, you name it. Okay, well, those those business partners don't have to comply with U.S. law. So what do you do? Does that, get, does that get you off the hook? Well, no. First of all, they're still business associates, and you better have a business associate contract with them. Second of all, that business associate contract should say they have to comply. In fact, that's just standard language. They have to comply with the security rule, the breach notification rule, blah, blah, blah. So you know, and I would treat them just like I would treat an American. Uh, you know, I would add additional terms for and conditions dealing with jurisdiction that they agree that they, they that we can get jurisdiction over them in this particular court, blah, blah, blah. 
So you're covering yourself via the contract with an international business associate because by law, they don't have to comply with U.S. law. They, they're free to ignore U.S. law. They have to comply with Indian law, whatever that is, or Chinese law, whatever that is, but they don't have to comply with U.S. law. But you do, whether you're the, the CE or a, 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 a business associate software vendor that's using these guys you know, and providing PHI to them. Right, so that's it's, it's a problem. Okay, now we're talking about software vendors because there's just a lot of software vendors that are playing in this space, and the reason there are is because healthcare is going to be one of the industries that that continues to spend billions and billions of dollars on IT and other stuff, even if the rest of the economy is kind of grinding to the halt. Healthcare right now is seeing a kind of renaissance. Okay, it's long overdue. My my thinking is that healthcare has gone through 150 years of change in five, but healthcare is a good place to be, whether you're a clinician or you're trying to sell into that space. So, you know, so there are a lot of software vendors that now need to deal with HIPAA, right? Now, the worst place to be if you get audited or if there's a breach is to be found in willful neglect. Okay, because if you're found in willful neglect, the fines start at fifty thousand. And they can go up to a million five. They can go up to a million five for an identical violation. That means a million five is not the max fine. That means that if you have ten different violations, well, that's what fifteen million instead of a million five. Okay. It, 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 the, 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 so there really there's no cap. That million it's this it's mis, uh, misleading that one point five million cap that you see. That's one point five million per identical violation. Now. HHS does throw the industry a break and say, well, breach, all breach, if you breach 50 records or 50,000, that's all treated as an identical violation, so you would be maxed out at 1.5, but when they come audit you, they're probably going to find 10 other things, and then, you know, so you, you, even even your fines are, are not likely to be that low, or, you know, maybe they decide, hey, you're just a small county government, we're just going to find you a couple hundred thousand dollars, but what does willful neglect mean? Well, you know, like everything else in HIPAA, sooner or later, some uh, federal court is going to determine that. But if all you have are legal documents and manuals, you know, those three ring manuals, and you don't have any processes that you can point to, if you just whip out those templates that you bought for fifty nine ninety five or whatever, but you don't have processes and tracking mechanisms, you're in willful neglect. Okay? Uh, if you have legal documents, let's say your business associate contract, but they're out of date or they don't meet the specific requirements. You know, you're probably going to be in willful neglect, right? You're you're no longer grandfathered in. You know, the uh, High Tech Act was promulgated in 2009, guys. We're like six years, right, from that. That was like that's ancient history. If you have no visible, demonstrable evidence that you are either in compliance or making a serious attempt at compliance, right? If you stuck your head in the sand and you and, and now you're scrambling to respond to one of these death audits. Probably you're not going to be able to scramble fast enough to avoid a finding a willful neglect. Let me tell you, there's two ways. There are two. There's three. There's three ways now that that you can get caught. Okay. One is you have a breach. If you have a major breach or even a minor breach, you probably are going to get audited. Okay. If and this is this applies less to software vendors than it does to covered entities, but if a patient complains to HHS. And on the face of the complaint, HHS can determine that the facts demonstrate willful neglect. They are mandated to audit you. So let's just say that that's the pissed off patient scenario, use case. Okay? You can call it the pissed off patient use case because they complain. Like you, they ask, let's say they ask for their PHI, and you did what uh, Signet did and just ignored 20 patients. Okay, you just said, nah, we're not going to give it to you, right? Now, you're supposed to give it to them within 30 days, and if you don't give it to them within 30 days, you're supposed to write them a letter telling them when you are going to give it to them. If you just ignore them and don't give them their PHI, well, that's willful neglect on its face. You can expect an audit, right? So a breach or a pissed-off patient, and now the third thing is it depends on where HH, HHS goes with their desk audits. If they really start doing tens of thousands of desk audits, uh, which I, you know, purely from an agency perspective, I don't see why they wouldn't do that because the money all goes back into their own coffers. 
So it's just, you know, it's a presidential uh, election season. It's just a, they lack the political will to do it because really they had a virtual money machine. So it's a little inexplicable why, inexplicable why they haven't done more. Okay, so willful neglect. Any questions, Martin? Yes, the one question uh, that we covered before when you said uh, the BA should go after a non-compliant C, what is the basis for that? Shouldn't the BA protect the PHI and abide by the BAA? How would the BA have any additional responsibility? The responsibility is not go after. The, it's not like go after, like sue. Okay, the affirmative, the affirmative duty is that you can't ignore the fact that a business, a covered entity, is in material breach of the contract. Okay, if you know, if you know for whatever reason, however you came to have this knowledge that the covered entity is in material breach of the contract, you have an affirmative duty for one of another word to rat them out. Well, not necessarily that's the first thing you do. You got to try to get them to cure it. You got to go through this process, but eventually you have an affirmative duty to act. You can't look the other way. Okay? Now, obviously we all know that puts the business associates in a precarious position because it's usually the covered entity that is the economically stronger partner and now you're going to now you have to go and confront them and risk maybe a a profitable contract by doing so. Well, I mean, I understand the nature of the problem, but I'm trying to explain to you what the law says, okay? And the law says that's why, that's why they did it. That's why they wrote it in there so that there would be more cooks in the compliance kitchen, more people on the beat, more people figuring out if everybody or trying to figure out if each other were doing the right thing, all right? So this was by design. This reciprocal monitoring wasn't something they just threw in there. They knew. They, they did it by design, and they did it for that very reason. So that and that's the bottom line. You can't look the other way, and if you do look the other way, then you're in violation. Okay. Going back to the lost phone with that may or may not have a picture in it, what are the specific requirements for what has to be included, the breach notification to the patient? Uh, actually, that's a webinar all, all, um, all onto itself. And if you were one of our subscribers, you get all our webinars in the library. But there is the breach notification regulations and the, and the statute specify the content that needs to be provided to the patient during notification. Okay? And... There's specific processes regarding how many how, how many out of date contact records you have as to what determines um, the manner by which you notify. Okay, and the size of the breach determines if it's 500 or over. Um, then you have to notify HHI. I believe this is this is the right number. I could be off by one. If it because they, they because they did it different for the media, but if it's 500 or over, you have to notify HHS within 60 days. If the breach is less than 500, you have to notify HHS within 60 days of the end of the calendar year. So there are two types of uh, persons or entities that are always notified. The patients are always notified by the covered entity, and HHS is either going to be notified immediately or I mean within 60 days if it's 500 or more, or at the end of the year, okay? And then, if you have, I believe, uh, greater than 500, like 501, in any state or jurisdiction, then you have to notify major media in that state or jurisdiction. So if you had 501 patients' records breached in Florida, you would have to notify major media in Florida. And if those patients were scattered throughout North, Central, and South Florida, you would have to notify major media in all those areas to try to get everybody. Okay, That would be 501 records in one state. If you had 250 in one state and 251 in another state, then you don't have 501 in a state or jurisdiction, and you don't have to, you still have to notify HHS, you still have to notify the patients, but you don't have to notify major 
media, okay? And that's just the criteria they came up with as to when uh, media had to be notified. So there, it, it, suffice to say that there's a lot of detail related around uh, what you need to provide. And our breach notification framework really provides not only the analysis of where the analytical framework of when a breach is triggered, we provide you model letters and you know to the media, to HHS, et cetera, a bunch of tools that help you uh, meet those requirements. Okay. Um, so if you approach the CE and they didn't do anything, then you go to HHS. Or yeah, I mean essentially, uh, yes. I mean essentially, it's a it's a CYA exercise, right? If they refuse to if they refuse to cure, right? Then that's your only option to cover your butt from any potential liability, right? Is is to report. That's that's the affirmative duty. That's all you can do. Uh, okay, let me. That's all we have at this point. Uh, one, okay, so one, one note that came through, the federal budget, the audit budget is $1 million for for FCI federal. So, I don't know what that means. Well, apparently the, the, the point that the individual is trying to make is they don't throw a lot of money at, at the audit budget since it's supposed to be self-sustaining. Oh, right. Right, I mean that makes sense because HHS had a you know a virtual money machine that they're not using, you know God knows why. But okay, All right, we've already covered this. But look, business associate contracts—they've always been required under the HIPAA privacy rule and security rule. This is nothing new under high tech. They've always been required. What's different now is this concept of reciprocal monitoring. What's also different is now subcontractors of BAs will be treated as business associates. Okay. Um, and that you have to have additional terms and conditions, okay? But the, the concept of business associate contract, that's been around for a long, long time. Why lead with compliance? Well, we talked about this. You're a software vendor. This this issue of HIPAA compliance is not going away. You get out in front of it. If your people, if your salespeople, your technical people are the smartest people in the room, then that's, that's, that's a differentiator because, look, covered entities are struggling to figure out how to deal with this beast, you know? And if you if you can go and say, look, here's how we mitigate the risk. We have, we you know, we comply with the security rule, we encrypt all our stuff, we do X, Y, and Z, it, it, you know, it's a potential uh, marketplace uh, differentiator for you, right? So here, you know, here's the recommendations uh, from a marketing perspective. Become the smartest guy or gal in the room. Become a smart subject matter expert. Focus on risk management and risk mitigation, how you help the CE do that. Address the CE's pain points, and then harden your own compliance touch points. Like I said, implement, make sure you're implementing encryption, you know, make sure you're, you're doing risk assessments frequently and that you can show, uh, you know, that you can show the CE that you're doing these things. And of course, you know, bring the donuts because you always got to bring the donuts. Uh, now look, this getting the subject matter expertise this is really a commitment. This is why most of your most of your competition is not going to do it because you can't have this baby in one month. HIPAA is a complex animal. It always has been. It used to be ignored, safely ignored, because nobody ever paid the price for it. All right. Now it's not being ignored as much because breach notification, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But this isn't going away. So this is something that you got to commit to. Like any other thing that's going to give you uh, a, comp a competitive advantage, it requires an investment of both time and money. But Really, it's more time than money. I mean, our subscription, where you get like 20 some odd products, checklists, training, blah, 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 you can get the whole subscription for 795 a year. And then optionally, 495 for the out years if you want to renew. Okay? But, you know, that 795 description, uh, subscription with all those products is not going to do any good unless you actually listen to the videos, implement the products, understand the breach notification framework, etc. It's all about education, education, education. So primary reason for becoming a subject matter expert really is to show that you are better than your competition at managing risk, right? First thing you should understand is you got to learn the, the, the lingo, right? If you can't talk to talk, you're dead in the water right away. Now, look, more covered entities have become savvy by the day, and they're starting to ask for indemnification, insurance, and a lot of other things in the contracts. If you walk in and someone asks you about HIPAA identification and 
cyber law insurance and you get that deer in the headlights look, then they're going to know right away that you're probably not a player, right? Because you don't even know. You're not even in the game. You don't even understand the lingo, right? And these, these, are, these are tough topics. How much cyber insurance should we get? And the insurance companies are having a hard time pricing it because it's really, really new, all right? So these, these complex issues are starting to manifest themselves in the industry, right? Because the CEs know that they're at risk. And if they can put off some of that risk on you, they're going to try to do it because nine times out of ten, they're the economically stronger party. So how do you go about doing this, addressing the CE points? Well, first you got, you know, get your own house in order, right, so that you can tell them what you're doing and then effectively articulate the joint risk. And your team members are the high-tech HIPAA savvy enough to offer consultative advice. I mean, right, it, it, people like dealing with smart people because, it, you know, if you can help them find ways to deal with their pain, it gives you uh, an advantage. But like I said, you got to be the real deal. Otherwise, you know, it, forget about it. It's just not going to really help you. So you got to walk the talk, essentially. Uh, the software that you provide to CE must be high-tech HIPAA. Not compliant, right? Because I know everybody, I know all the software vendors. I know all you guys say that our product is a HIPAA compliant product. You know, it's a HIPAA, it's a HIPAA compliant this, that, or the other. Really, that's just marketing speak, though, because it's clear the only the only entities that can be HIPAA compliant are business associates and covered entities. There's no such thing as a HIPAA compliant product. Okay, it's 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 marketing speak. Now, as long as you know it's marketing speak, then okay. Fine, right? But uh, <clears throat> but it's a misnomer. You know, you can you, you, your products can help business associates and covered entities comply. But there's no certification, and there's no reason that you can really genuinely say that you have a HIPAA compliant product. I can almost guarantee you, uh, even though the High Tech Act has been out for six years now, most of your competitors aren't making the investment, and so. You know, a, you, you can have a first move, uh, mover advantage. Um, so, right, this it, it's getting brutally competitive everywhere. You know, healthcare industry is going to be no different. So, it's eat lunch or uh, be lunch. Bring the donuts. Shameless plug. We got a subscription plan with products that uh, educate, that allow you to get started day one, executing on your. Uh, compliance plan that can really get you there if you invest your time. We got, I don't know, 18, 19, I always get this number wrong, Martin training modules. We got a whole suite of training on how to survive a HIPAA audit. Uh, checklists that go through every requirement in the HHS protocol for the privacy rule, the security rule. We have that um, CSMM social media and mobile and cloud uh, checklist to deal with the complexities of that kind of relationship. We like to think that we provide the recipe, not just the ingredients. Educational products really that you can start using day one. Obviously, you got to eat this element a bite at a time. But we we uh, built the offering so that you could use it uh, a bite at a time. Uh, it's agile compliance. It's really agnostic as to whether you're a business associate or a covered entity. It applies to both. We like to think of it as wetware. Wetware is focused on what you, what and how you know to comply, uh, instead of just being a repository where you keep compliance documents. So uh, there you go. We have a, a little time. I think we're good on time. So if there's other questions, yeah, we can take more questions. No, we don't have any more questions at this time. Well, great. Uh, you can click on these products or go out to the HIPAA Survival Guide and click on the coffee cup to get to our store. These look inside um, uh, documents are all out there. Uh, and if you need more questions, then just hit us up via email. It's been, it's been my pleasure being with you guys today. We are... Uh, not going to have a webinar in December, but we will start our series again in January. Thank you.